The Philadelphia Eagles are reigning NFC champions. Are they primed to repeat and perhaps go even further? It's Eagles Day, and we're breaking them down from every angle today on the Locked On NFL Scouting Podcast. You are Locked On NFL Scouting with the Draft Dudes, your daily podcast for NFL and college football scouting. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's better than this? It's guys being dudes here on the Locked On NFL Scouting Podcast. We're the Draft Dudes. I'm Joe Marino from Locked On Bills. He's Kyle Krabs from Locked On Dolphins. And we are your NFL experts here with you daily to talk team building across the league on the Locked On NFL Scouting Podcast with the Draft Dudes, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'd like to thank you for making Locked On NFL Scouting your first listen every day and a big welcome to our everydayers. You know who you are. Those of you who never miss a single episode, we appreciate y'all being here very, very much. Joe, happy National Joe Marino's birthday to you here on this Friday, June 2nd, 2023 episode of Locked On NFL Scouting. Happy birthday. Wow, a national, a national. National day for you. Wow, that's incredible. Thank you. I appreciate it. I have to be honest. I was planning on doing something that embarrassed you more. um, Oh, wow. And then my wife blew my cover because I'm like, all right, I've talked to Joe a few times today. I didn't acknowledge that it's his birthday, so I'm just going to roll into the show and get on the air, and then we'll do a big thing. And it's like, oh, I didn't forget your birthday. Oh. And then 45 minutes before we went on the air, my wife texted me and said, it's Joe's birthday with a bunch of ex- exclamation points. And as I am typing back, yeah, don't say anything. I'm going to do something and surprise mm-hmm. him on the show. The group text came up with you, me, and both of our wives, and she acknowledged that it was your birthday. So mm-hmm. my cover was blown, and it scrapped my plans. So well, just never want to just wish you a happy birthday on the show. Ne- never a doubt that you would you would not forget. So no, Naturally thank throw you. my wife Appreciate under the bus in the process. Wow, I mean, it, well, that way you got to throw someone under the bus here, at the right? Beginning. Because yeah, there, yeah. there should this could have been a much more grand voice thing, and instead I'll, you know, it's, it's Friday. I'll, I'll just raise my glass. To you. Cheers, cheers. Kyle's cheers, got apple birthday. juice. Apple juice here as we record. Mm. It's my daughter's leftover apple juice. So yeah, that makes sense. Eagles. Uh, yeah. What did you have? You had something. I had a transition to get us to the Eagles. That's to the all. Eagles. Yeah. <laughs> That's all it was, oh, man. Look, it's your birthday. Let me do the heavy lift here. Okay. All right. Talk about the Eagles to... today on the show. And if you're new to the the process here, or you're a Philadelphia Eagles fan just tuning in for the first time, please know this: uh, we are taking a day to evaluate the rosters for all 32 teams across the NFL. With the objective being. Uh, assigning categories for each player that is under contract for the projected, I will say 53, but the projected meaningful contributors. For some teams, it's it's 45 players long. For other teams, it might be 55 players long, and they'll cut a couple people off at the end of the day when they get down to 53-man cuts or whatever. But the objective is to watch the film, look at these players, look at their development and their trend and the commitment to them as players, and put them into the following buckets. Roster cornerstones, Quality starters, you know what, we don't have any, there's no dramatic effect to not put the depth chart up. So for those of you who are watching on YouTube, I'm going to put it up here on the front. Roster cornerstone, quality starter, adequate starter, rookies, replacement level starters, quality depth, non-roster caliber players, incomplete evaluations, and practice squad developmental types. We want to put all of the players on all of the rosters into these buckets There's a numerical value that is associated with it that you don't have to worry about. Just know that we're showing you the process that when we get to the end of the road, we're like, here's our roster power rankings for the best constructed rosters in the NFL. And we'll have that conversation when we do all the teams, but we have to do each team individually and have a thorough process. And and this is effectively us showing our work to do that. And we're here to talk about the Eagles today. Yeah, Show show your work. That's what we're doing. And this is going to lead to lots of fun conversations. Like you mentioned, roster rankings, positional rankings, all kinds of stuff as we get ready for the 2023 NFL season. Starting with this offense, right? I mean, I'd like to go to the offensive line. I mean, best offensive line in football. I don't know how you can make a case against it. I mean, you have four absolute pillars in my the Aussie. Landon Dickerson, Jason Kelsey is still playing at a high level. That was one of my favorite things was, uh, and I was watching this offense this morning, I wanted to really see where Kelsey was at. And folks, still playing at a really, really high level. I haven't seen a drop-off. 
And then Lane Johnson, was that his best season last year? Was he 33? I mean, yeah. he's unbelievable. And so you're having a transition here at one of your guard spots with Isaac Siamalu, now a Pittsburgh Steeler. And you have options, right? Cam Jurgens, a player you drafted um, two years ago, pretty high. Tyler Steen, you just got him in the second round this past year. And Sua Upeta, who's been a, a good backup for them. And so you just kind of have to figure that one spot out. But my goodness, with those four other guys locked in, you can hardly be that concerned. Well, and then you also have, you know, I think Driscoll has some flexibility. Yeah, that's a good call. Yep. And, and Toth has has played center. So he's he's played interior before, or he's gotten reps in interior before. So you could feasibly take four of the five guys on the two deep that aren't projected as starters mm -hmm. along with Tyler Steen, the mid-round rookie that you got and install them in. I think that, and, and the stability of having Lane Johnson on your right hand side and Jason Kelsey on your left hand Dude, side. What a, what dream, a dream situation for young interior offensive linemen. I might to be step able to into. get by. I might be able to get a yellow tag if I'm not, I mean, probably not. Not that I'm Probably a little not. older, but. I know. All right, so the offensive they're, line. They're, they're loaded up front. Yeah. They're absolutely. And they're, they are about as well equipped as you can be um, to get by if anybody misses time. I, I think if you missed both tackles for any extended period, that would stress you a little bit, but even like Driscoll being somebody who's capable in stepping in in the short stretch at one of the tackle spots. Yeah. Like, I feel like he's a really nice utility player for them. So I, I feel really good about the positional flexibility of the guys that they have in the event that they have to reshuffle as attrition hits this offensive line throughout the course of the season. So these weapons, and I'm going to start in a weird place if I can, um, because the pronunciation police like to come, come at us hard a lot um i know how Every to say day. lama day zacchaeus because he taught me how to say it it's lama day lama lama day, day. lama day zacchaeus everybody knows about Devonte smith awesome young player aj brown absolute stud dallas godard absolute stud i really like lama day zacchaeus coming to this football team and being you know potentially their their featured slot player you know i i feel like that's a fun skill set to introduce here to these other players um and Devontae Smith, the growth that he showed last year, big game in the Super Bowl, obviously. A.J. Brown, I mean, year one with this team, you wouldn't know that. I mean, this guy just was physically dominant um, playing all over the place for this football team. And so Jalen Hurts, a quarterback, has a nice stable of weapons to throw the football to. I don't know that they can have a ton of injuries here. I think they need those top three to stay healthy. Um, but you've got – I mean, you got two franchise cornerstones as your top two receivers. You're, I mean, is there going to be another team that has two receivers and a tight end as a franchise cornerstone? Um, you had me until tight end. No. Right, the tight end piece. Because it's going to be Andrews, Kittle, Kelsey, Godard. Who else is getting the blue tag, you know? Very few. To go with two blue tag, or royal blue tag wide receivers? I mean, yeah. come on. Now, this is... Is a really good group. Look, this is this is quintessential building around a young quarterback, right? Oh man, yeah. I mean, and the fact that they they traded for, they reunited Devonte Smith with Jalen Hurts when they played together at Alabama, and then you trade you see what that looks like, and you trade for AJ Brown. Dallas Goder obviously was it was a prior investment, and is one of the most complete tight ends in football. I think it's a shame that he missed five games last year in the regular season. Otherwise, the production would be much closer to, I think, where both you and I value him as a player when you look at his ability as a blocker and what he can do as a receiver and run after the catch ability and how good his hands are. He's a very complete player at the position. I mean, is is it safe to say, Goder, how many tight ends would you rank above Dallas Goder right now in the lexicon of NFL tight ends? Not many. He's he's five or six probably in that range. I don't want to forget anybody. I mean, he's but. in that. Yeah, it's the like Kittle, Kelsey, Andrews, Goder, Wall. I mean, Waller, a healthy Waller. Some fan out there is yelling at us right now. I'm sure of it. Hawkinson. <laughs> no, that's the next year. <laughs> Welcome to the next year, right? Right. Like, Right. Well, I mean, let's be honest. It's Kelsey, right? It's Kelsey, and then <laughs> tier two is right. Then the we other start group. 
Right. <laughs> Kyle Kyle Pitts is probably in tier three. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Physically capable of being more. Uh, I'm excited for Greg Dulcich to be a tier three tight end by this yeah, time next except year. Except for Peyton's comments. You see this? Talking no. about the Joker position and invoking the name Taysom Hill. Get out of here with that. No. Let's not Just do let Greg Dulcich be Greg Dulcich. Anyway, anyway. Uh I do wish the running back room was more firm. I think they have depth. I think they have a lot of players who can be contributors. But the Jalen Hurts component of rushing the football, I think, alleviates any concern that I have that's like, eh, I don't know that you really got better. I know DeAndre Swift is that thing every offseason where this is the year he's going to turn the corner, and I wouldn't expect it to happen. Um, I, would rather, I would rather have healthy Rashad Penny. Dude, if Rashad Penny's healthy, they've got a great running back. Correct. But that's just never been the case. But it's never been the case for an extended period for more than what? Six, six, seven weeks at a time? Right. Now, but he's a stud. Now, I think when you have DeAndre Swift, Kenneth Gainwell, and Rashad Penny, you've got enough guys there that can be 15, 15 to 18 carries a game, guys, if you need them to be for stretches and then somebody gets banged up and it's okay, then you can plug the next guy in and because you have the compliment of Jalen Hurts and with how good the running game is, I think they will, will repeat as being a highly successful NFL rushing offense. They just, they just don't have a standalone guy in that group. That's all. One of the things that really stood out to me studying the Eagles this morning and, you know, like we, we watch the film, we're studying the players, their careers, like everything. And I, of course, I was very aware of the Eagles last year and all the storylines and watched tons of their games and all that type of stuff. But one thing that was revealing to me was just how much volume they gave to Miles Sanders as their mm-hmm. lead back last year. I mean, 259 carries in the regular season to go with you know, 20 catches. I mean, their next highest running back in terms of rushing attempts was Boston Scott at 54. I mean, this guy had had the 200 and draft dudes do math, 204. Five, Jacob. is that? Did I get it? It's it's ballparked. Yeah, two, over two hundred more, carri- more than two hundred <laughs> more than two hundred carries. Then the next highest running back on the team. I mean that yeah. that really surprised me. And so tra- I, it doesn't surprise me that they transitioned away from him. There's still there's still things about watching Miles Sanders where like, hey, great play. Feel like there's probably another five yards there for you. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's kind of the deal with Miles. And then ball um, security has historically been a right sticking point with him too but they're they're transitioning there that's the point there and so they're leaning into i you i mean the the incumbents are gainwell and scott but the it feels like the two new arrivals and penny and swift are where the the bulk of these carries are going to go you'd expect that yeah. yeah um anything else offensively i have the death chart up now before we we switch gears no, I, I mean, I'm really unconcerned about running back, though. I, this offensive line, this system, Jalen Hurts. It's the least they have talent. About their offense. Yeah, I, could only, I can only give so much concern to that, to be honest with you. Right. So. Okay. All right. Getting into the defense here as we continue this conversation about the Philadelphia Eagles today on the Lockdown NFL Scouting Podcast. But first, make a fast break. To FanDuel during the NBA playoffs because right now new customers can get a no sweat first bet up to $2,500. That's $2,500 back in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. And I love placing my bets over at FanDuel. They got great promotions every day. You get paid instantly. It's a safe and secure app, and they have tons of stuff that you can get into. Of course, the NBA finals are happening right now. Heater coming. Look, it's only one game. We've got a lot of let it play out. Panthers in, in the nights, right? That's happening. Tomorrow night. In, in, in the NHL world, you've got baseballs in full swing. You've got football's futures. If you want to get in on who you think could be the NFL MVP or rookie of the year, all that type of stuff, you can get in it, on it over at FanDuel, and there's simply no better place to get on, on, on all these sports action than America's number one sports book. So visit FanDuel.com slash lockdown and get that no sweat first bet up to $2,500. That's FanDuel.com slash lockdown. FanDuel official sports betting partner of the NBA. All right, so, Joe, over on the um, offensive side of the ball, there really wasn't that much attrition for the Eagles. You saw Isaac Siamalu, the right guard, and Miles Sanders, who we both acknowledge leave in free agency, going to Pittsburgh and Carolina, respectfully. But the defensive side of the ball, uh, I think there's a lot more attrition and new 
opportunities and snaps to be had. Uh, you think about Chauncey Gardner Johnson, who they acquired right before the start of the season, him leaving after a one year stint, Javon Hargrave getting uh, the bag and a half from the San Francisco 49ers to the tune of $21 million per season. Uh, TJ Edwards, uh, who had been a successful kind of developmental player for them, who shined last year as an inside linebacker. The investments that they made as reinforcements to the interior defensive line with Ndamukong Su and Linval Joseph midseason. Neither one of those two is currently back. Uh, I think they surprised with the ability to bring both the corners back, and that's a good thing. But there's some upheaval here. Marcus Epps. Some, Marcus Epps. Kaiser White. There's some reps to be had, <laughs> so particularly in the middle of this defense that I think is is very interesting to to kind of prep for. Yeah, I mean there there is going to be some some turnover here, but this defensive line, this edge rusher, this defensive tackle situation is still just tremendous, especially on the edge where Hassan Reddick was like firmly in the defensive player of the year conversation last year to go with Josh Sweat, who's a really nice player. Brandon Graham is still an impact playmaker. They got Nolan Smith in, in the draft, who I think is maybe a more explosive physical version of Hassan Reddick. I mean, I, that's just an unbelievable situation, not to mention Derek Barnett. And then you have this interior situation that, you know, Jalen Carter, who, I don't know, like if you take away the off-the-field stuff or things that you might get concerned about, he might be the best talent in the draft from last year. They wind up getting him to go with Jordan Davis, who, you know, we're still seeing what he's got, but obviously really gifted physical specimen. Fletcher Cox is still a veteran here. Milton Williams is emerging as a young depth player. I mean, they're loaded up front still. And, and if you believe in defenses and their ability to win up front, really setting the tone for the entire unit, and that's that's where I find myself, I can get concerned about the safeties and the linebackers, but these players up front still, despite losing Hargrave and, and Sue and – you know, some of the guys they added late in the season, man, I, it's it's still in good shape to me. And they might be better with the, tr- with the coordinator switch, too. Right. Desai coming in is a nice addition for them. Yeah. And I know Eagles had all those sacks last year, but Jonathan Ginn would be the first to tell you that the Eagles and the media weren't huge fans of certain components of how that defense was run last year. Are you, are, are you at all worried about just – just the spine of the defense unless you like the Georgia guys have to play big. They have to play big because if the Georgia guys don't show up, Jordan Davis and Jalen Carter, second and first year players inside, you've got an aging Fletcher Cox who's still effective, but is not the player that he was at his peak when he was one of the best interior defensive linemen in football. You do have an undersized player in Milton Williams who I think played close to 300 snaps last year defensively and, and flashed a bit, but then like, a Joe Mo is a rookie who I liked a lot, but he's kind of a base and hybrid type anyway. Kentavious Street, Marlon Tupolotu, and then behind it, your linebackers, Nicobe Dean, Nicholas Moreau, Sean Bradley, Davion Taylor. Like, I don't know. I, I think about the, in, the interior of the front seven is the one area for Philadelphia where you acknowledge the departures that they had and their meaningful departures and that was already a, an area for them that was somewhat of a question, case in point, how they went out and signed two veteran defensive tackles last year. Mm-hmm. And it's that group just needs those big investments to play big early, in my mind. Or they can just go back out and sign Domicong Sue and Linval Joseph, trade for Buda Baker, uh, <laughs> sign Matt and I, Ioannidis, right. Shelby Harris. Right. I mean, it feels like the the – the back pocket of Howie Roseman for cards he can play is just endless. And he does. And so, yeah, I think that's – it's worth acknowledging that we don't know what Jalen Carter or J- Jordan Davis is going to be, and they need them. But, I mean, they're supremely gifted players that were taken – Even a linebacker, though. Nicobe Dean – we love Nicobe Dean coming out. Is he ready to be the green dot player? Gonna have to be. Right. They got an experienced player in Nicholas Moreau to go with him, but I mean, he's just been a guy, right? He had like one good season a couple years ago with the Raiders, like where his coverage was good, but you know, I think he's like smaller, undersized, safety convert. But this has kind of been what they what they do. 
It's kind of right. figure it you, out I mean, at linebacker. Case of point, you, you look at analytics and you look at roster construction and, and what do we most frequently discuss are the least valueized positions in football, running back and linebacker. Yeah. The, the Eagles are the embodiment of that for better or for worse. I mean, they, they are sitting here telling you, we don't think it matters. And they're probably going to be right, but I, I would at least be remiss to not have the discussion and say, as, as yeah. I look at the construction of the Eagles, the question mark I have on the roster is the interior of the front seven. And, and that messaging hits with the fans, too. Like, they buy in, too. I have, right. I mean, I know you have friends that are Eagles fans. I do do as well. And, like, we talk about the team, and I was like, we're like where, where are you weak? Well, linebacker and running back. Like, we don't care. Howie doesn't care about linebackers and running backs. Neither do we. And, like, okay, I can't. What, what am I supposed to say? I wish my fan base trusted my GM as much as Howie Roseman <laughs> gets trust from Eagles fans. Um, I guess all right, so for two Super Bowls in five years, that'll do that. With really different makeups. Right. You, right. This is a weird sidebar, but I was listening to Chris Long. Great podcast, by the way. Um, he had Howie Roseman on last week or so. And Chris Long said this year's Eagles team was better than the Super Bowl team that Chris Long was on back in 2017. I would agree and with that. Howie was not ready to agree to that. But mm. I would, I, I with Chris Long on this. I like, I think the seventeen or this team was better than the seventeen team. But Howie was like, no. That's he, a fun he, debate. I'm sure Eagles fans have debated it. Man, I mean, I, I hope he, Locked On Eagles has done that podcast. <laughs> right, Louis. If you're listening, you should do that yeah, podcast. Louis, make it a three day thing. <laughs> do offensive I'm, comparisons, defensive comparisons, and then come come right. to a decision. Imagine the Dolphins go to two Super Bowls in five years. You definitely would do that, right? Like, oh, oh, man, I, I would be the most obnoxious person on the, the internet. And, you know, look, I think that's why we, we can't have the Dolphins <laughs> winning the Super Bowl. It's for, it's for everyone else. You know, we, we'll be happy for your happiness. But <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Take a good joke. Take a good joke. We have we have these dynamics we have to deal with. Uh, like you mentioned, these corners are back. Darius Slay, James Bradbury. Didn't think that was going to happen. It did. Darius Slay still playing at a high level. James Bar- Bradbury still playing really well. Um, and, you know, they went out and got another Georgia guy there in the draft, and Keely Ringo, to be in the pipeline, to go with the uh, underrated guy in Greedy Williams that might, you know, provide them. Too. Yeah, like nice depth in case something yeah. happens with one of those guys. I like what they've done on the back end in general. Bringing in Sidney Brown in the draft, who's what was one of my favorite players. He's he's perfect fit for this defense. I don't know that he's going to push for a starting role early, but he's a good tackler. He's versatile. He's good in run support. So if you're going to play him in these Desai as a Fangio esque disciple, the cover six stuff, and and you're going to have him be the safety who's on the backside, and he's. Uh, the, the hash defender, and he gets to sit sit on in-breaking routes and, and then come down late into the run fit and be a tackler. Like I think that's really a a strong area for, for Sidney Brown that I think he can really shine in. So I'm excited about his fit in the defense. You, you mentioned bringing the guys back, and then Greedy Williams and Keely Ringo as new additions to this group as well. Plus Terrell Edmonds coming in to, to take the Chauncey Gardner-Johnson spot, spot in the defense, at least for the time being. You know, I, I think this is a, a deeper corner room and defensive backfield than it was last year. I, and they were good last year. I'd like to hear from you a little bit more on this coordinator switch. Jonathan Gannon to Desai, who's, like you mentioned, a Fangio disciple, somebody who you studied a lot recently. You know, I, what what do you think, like, at its core is going to be different schematically with this group? I don't know that there's much that is going to be different defensively. I think you're going to see a lot of overlap from the ideology that the team implemented last year. Uh, I think you will see a lot of the same approach. I think you'll have rotations up front, a lot of guys getting a lot of snaps, keep pass rushers fresh, that kind of standard Fangio defense um, ideology of we're going to present frequent pre-snap picture to you. And what I love most about that ideology, and this this is for Fangio and all of the disciples who try to implement it, is, Joe, from a, a passing efficiency perspective, what really helps, and please take the bait here, what really helps passing efficiency uh, at the NFL level or in, in all levels of football? 
What do you do to, to be more efficient throwing the football? Man, I, what's the low-hanging fruit here? My mind's going a million different places. What do you what did you want the Bills to do more of last year? Oh, hit the easy button. In what Quick way? game, short passing, yards after catch. Play play action? Play action, yeah, that's my biggest complaint. Yeah, they had a 10% drop in play action, yeah. Okay, well, what happens with play action? The quarterback does what? Turns his back Turns to the defense, back to the ball. right? Yeah, yeah. So if your static presentation's the same all the time, and you play pass off of that, and you turn your back to the defense at the snap, and you get your eyes back around, and now every snap it's a totally different presentation, and you got no pre-snap information because they say, we're going to show you the same thing every single time. Mm -hmm. It really slows down the process of the quarterback. It eliminates their ability to cross off routes in their head as far as the concepts on what they want to run. They have to go through the full progression after the snap. And if you're going to do that out of play action, he's getting to the top of his drop and he's really now just getting into first progression, second progression, instead of being all the way through at the top of the drop. And that's, I think, how Philadelphia had all the success that they had rushing the passer last year. They had loads of pass rushers. I mean, they lost Robert Quinn, but that's really was what their fifth most important outside pass rusher. This is a case in much. point for, yeah. for what that roster was last year. Yeah. So you got all these dudes that can rush the passer, and you're you're forcing the quarterback's process to slow down because of the ideology of how you're approaching lining up pre-snap. And I think the, the side you, you would expect is going to carry a lot of that with him being a Fangio disciple and uh, the imprint that was left on the team from last year in the system that they ran. All right. Eagles defense. There it is. Studs. All right. So normally in our third segment, we would come to consensus on any disagreements. Kyle and I had Go some ahead. minor things. We went ahead and handled it in the, uh, in the pre-show. And so everyone's had a chance to see how we've categorized this roster. After a quick break, we're going to get into some big picture stuff here as we've moved along through this process. So Joe, would, would you like the, raw data of players in different categories or would you like the team scoring in certain position groups across that we've done 13 so almost halfway through the league do you want to do which one of those two first doesn't make a difference whatever you're ready for i'll say this if you look at and i'll pull up the eagles depth chart quality starters and roster cornerstones 15 combined starters including the specialists for the Philadelphia Eagles are either roster cornerstones or quality starters out of a possible 25 players. Mm. 15. And then, oh, by the way, another six are adequate starters. Um, the only other team that sniffs that total that we have done thus far is the San Francisco 49ers, who also have 15 cornerstones and quality starters amongst their 25 starters in the projected depth chart. It's a good place to live. I'm I'm looking through the data and there's not there's not many with more than ten, you know. No. Like <laughs> Atlanta nine, Carolina right now eleven. I think we've kind of made a vow that we're gonna work back to Carolina as we see how their number ranks out. And was that that was the first team we did right? Very first team, yeah. Yeah. So Chicago six, Denver eight, Green Bay nine, Houston four, Indianapolis eleven, Jacksonville nine, New England nine. Philadelphia, 15. Pittsburgh, 9. San Francisco, 15. Washington, 5. Those are the teams that we have done thus far and where they check in for the number out of the 25, 11 on O, 11 on D, and the three specialists, kicker, punter, and long snapper. Uh, we will put an asterisk on the Broncos. They don't have a kicker yet, so we'll... Yeah. Maybe, they, maybe they'll get an extra quality start. Neither does Dallas. There's, what are these teams doing with these kickers, man? Get so. yourself a damn kicker and stick with it. Uh, that is the first thing that stands out to me is just that the Eagles and 49ers are in a class of their own in the rosters that we have evaluated to this point. Case in point, they're the only two teams that have cracked 20 possible points on this scoring scale. And I think the best team that we had last year had 27. Mm. Um, but that was with the quarterbacks. And right now we don't have any of the quarterbacks graded because the way that we grade quarterbacks is after we put them all in buckets, we rank them one through 32 and you get a certain amount of points out of that. So there's, it's not like you could say, Oh yeah, there's 10 roster cornerstones at quarterback. So all 10 teams 
get the maximum amount of points. It don't work that way with quarterbacks. So uh, Philadelphia and, and San Francisco, uh, very, very, very good rosters, very complete rosters. They have rosters that last year would have flagged to say, yeah, that's probably a playoff team based off the total number of points that they've allocated, and we haven't even done the quarterback allocation yet. Mm. And, and this is going to get really exciting as we get through the next few weeks because we, I mean, we've done some good teams, but we've got good teams coming, right? We've got – I mean, next week, Miami, the Chargers, Dallas, Seattle's a playoff team, Cincy, Buffalo, Kansas City, Detroit, who's, you know, one of the uptick darlings the next two of the weeks, league. right? Right. Yeah. Hit subscribe on the podcast. Right. And then we still got the Jets and the Ravens and the Vikings and the Giants. So, I mean, there, there, there is just a lot. There's a lot to get to here, and I've, I've loved it, and we've got so much good feedback on it. But seeing you – know, starting to take a peek at the big picture stuff, Gets me even more excited about finishing right. and working through this to see how it all stacks up and then what we can build off of it. It's going to be really fun. So just to keep this somewhat Philly-centric, uh, Philadelphia has the second-best skill group that we have graded thus far. Uh, San Francisco does edge them out with – they have a cornerstone at tight end, they have a cornerstone at running back, they have a cornerstone at wide receiver, and then they have another quality starter – uh, at tight end, they get use check credit there, and then they have um, Brandon Ayuk. So just a little bit more in Ooh, that's the That's a fun debate. Depth Let's portion. put that in the comments. In the comments of the YouTube channel today, which skill group do you like better? San Philly, or Philly or San Francisco in the NFC? Oh, you I'd know Philly's going to gonna wipe the floor with the comments because it's a Philly video. Well, show up, San Francisco. I was show pleasantly up. surprised how many comments we got. Everybody wants the free hat. Well, yeah, they got guys. Go you got to comment video. like that on all the videos. Yeah, come comment on all the videos like that. Yeah, um, Philadelphia is the best offensive line. Philadelphia has the best defensive front, courtesy of just the the waves of pass rushers that they have. Uh, they do have the worst linebacker room that we've graded thus far. I think that's probably <laughs> worth acknowledging. And Philly fans say we don't care. We don't care. Don't care. <laughs> <laughs> uh, defensive backfield, they have the second best secondary that we've graded thus far. This is also the first blue quarterback, a uh, franchise uh, cornerstone, cornerstone quarterback, quarterback that we've yeah. done yet. So he's gonna get, he's gonna get what you would imagine that the top four guys get ten points, and then the next three guys I think get nine points. So he's at worst gonna get nine points. At worst, yeah. So. Please regard me. His accuracy on some of those deep outs were really good. Yeah, he's that got the arm like, strength to really drive those throws. Yeah, and he's got some good touch on those throws, man. I was like, wow, you are – I couldn't and, – and finding Devontae Smith on some of those, I was like, wow, man, that's a really nice throw. And good chemistry. with The, the chemistry with Devontae shows up big time. Oh, there's no question. As far as the body control with Devontae. You wouldn't expect it. And, that's the thing is you just don't expect it. That – that the the Giants game was the first game that I watched this morning, and man, like there was they went for it on like a fourth and seven from like yeah. the thirty five and the playoff pretty, game. No, it was it was regular season one o'clock game on a, on Sunday. Oh, okay, it was fourth and seven. They just went for it, and he just threw it up. Safety couldn't get there. It was Julian Love. Julian Love couldn't get there. He it stacked on top of that corner, just caught it, touchdown on a fourth and seven, threw a bomb to him. I'm oh like, yeah, like, what is going on yeah. here? It's uh, incredible. Assuming Jalen Hurts gets the least amount of points that we're assuming that he's going to get, uh, Philadelphia is going to be over 28 points total. And again, I think the the highest score that we had last year was the summer edition. We got the Bills. I think they were 27 and a half. We I thought we had it pretty well stacked. It was Bills, Bengals, and Eagles were our top three rosters last year. Yes. And like Chiefs fans right now are probably like. Throwing their hands in the air. They, but like, they were seventh, and then when we redid it at midseason, I think they moved up to third or fourth. But, like, they still counted on, like, a billion rookies on defense. Like, miss me with right. it. Well, right? And that, that is the flaw of doing this kind of grading scale is rookies also, get a net zero. So what I like about it, they get right, zero, but it gives us that wiggle room, right? Like, Right. There's, there's upward and downward mobility to be able to identify, look, these teams have a bunch of net zero players that if they play well, this team's going to show up. Case in point, Seattle. No, no team rose more than Seattle did when we did the preseason version versus the midseason update, and it's because Charles Cross balled out, Abe Lucas balled out, Tariq Woolen balled out, 
Uh, Kenneth Walker balled out. I'm sure I'm forgetting at least one of the rookies. Kobe from Bryant the was pretty draft decent. Class. Yeah. But I mean, like all those guys balled out. Case point, that team won double digit games and made the playoffs. So I like that. I think one of the things that we did last year when we went through this was we took like the the incompletes and rookies and like which teams were relying the most on them and, and that yeah. gave us the most wiggle room. And it's gonna be revealing. Yep. For sure. Philly is not one of those teams. No. <laughs> They have very well established, very good players in a lot of spots. That's and a good they, way to put it. They have uh, another great season to look forward to ahead of them uh, in a competitive NFC East. Um, but you, you have to think it, at least this team stays relatively healthy. It's 11, 12 wins, probably. Uh, minimum. Some, yeah. And, you know, you'll put yourself in a position to win the division. I think Dallas will have something to say about that when it's all said and done. But. We'll do Dallas soon, so you got to plan accordingly. Come on back and see us. I'm Kyle Krabs. He is Joe Marino. He is the birthday boy. Please go wish Joe a happy birthday on social media at the Joe Marino. Uh, we are locked on NFL scouting. Appreciate you guys checking out the show. Shout out to our everydayers who are locked in on a daily basis. We hope you will hit subscribe, like the video, come back, see us again on Monday. We get the Dolphins up next. So, you know, uh, I'm going to try to pull some extra folks in on that one. But uh, you guys should be dialed in on every day, no matter what, because it makes you a better fan the more you understand about this league across all 32 teams, the better perspective it gives you to understand the mechanics of your own team. And that is our biggest hope with this exercise is that you will take that away. So enjoy your weekends. We will talk to you all again on Monday.